Naming bicyclic compounds, that'll be the topic in this lesson. We'll have three different variants. We'll have bridged bicyclics, fused bicyclics, and spiro bicyclics. So that we'll talk about in this lesson in my organic chemistry playlist. Now in this chapter, we've already covered a lesson on naming alkanes, and then we moved on to naming complex substituents, and this will be the last thing we need to learn how to name. So before we proceed on to talking about various conformational structures we need to look at and recognizing for alkanes. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is simply to make science both understandable and even enjoyable. Now, this is part of my new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a new video. All right, so special set of rules for naming these bicyclic compounds. And it turns out there's one set of rules that will work for both the bridged and fused bicyclics. And then we'll have a, a similar set of rules, but a little bit different for our spiro bicyclic compounds as well. All right, so how do you recognize the difference between these and stuff like this? So one thing you should know about our bridged bicyclics is there's a couple different funky ways we often draw them. Now, we can draw them in this kind of a sideways perspective that's a little bit new, and this will be due. So, or we could kind of draw it in the similar fashion to what you've seen. Now, what you see here is you've got a seven-membered ring. That's a cycloheptane by the old standards, but in this case, we can't just simply call it a cycloheptane because we also have another ring right here. Like if you look right around here, that's a ring. Now, these bonds right here, we call these wedged bonds, and they're meant to give us three-dimensional perspective. And for a wedged bond, it means it's coming out of the board. Like this is like a handle out here. So that's what those actually mean. And so we've got this lovely seven-membered ring right here, but if we look here, there's a five membered ring right here. And if we count around through here, that's another ring as well. And so we've got multiple rings on this. We call these bicyclics for a reason. And there's a whole special set of rules we name these. So you don't like find the biggest ring you can find in it and name it the parent. It doesn't work that way. Just a whole new set of rules. So first thing you want to do is in all your ring structures, you want to just count up the carbon. So in this case, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and there's an eighth. And so as a result, this parent compound of this name is going to be called bicyclooctane is going to be the name. So yeah, let's write that out. So let's get bicyclo and then octane. But notice I saved a little room in the middle and we'll see why that is here in a, in a sec. Next thing to figure out. So it turns out there's going to be three numbers placed in brackets in the middle of this. And I definitely didn't leave enough room here. So let's make that just a little bit bigger with our brackets. So, and we're going to put three numbers in there separated by periods. And those numbers are going to come from the structure here. So we have to identify what are called bridge head carbons here. And that's where it gets this name, these bridge bicyclics. So they've got these bridge head carbon atoms. And the bridge head carbon atoms are the carbons, in this case, this one here and here, or here and here, that are part of any of the rings. So whether you look at it as this ring right here, or this ring right here, or this ring right here, it's only these two carbons that are part of every single one of those rings. So they're called the bridgehead carbons. And what you wanna do is identify how many carbons are in between each of those bridge heads, no matter which pathway you take. So if we look like going around, say the left-hand side, I've got a carbon there and a carbon there. And so to get from bridgehead to bridgehead, there's two carbons in between. If I go around the other side, there's a carbon there and a carbon there and a carbon there. And so there's three carbons in between those bridge heads as you take this pathway to get from bridgehead to bridgehead. And then here, this right here represents a carbon as well. And so in this pathway, there's just a single carbon as you go from bridgehead to bridgehead. And so those are the three numbers we're going to use, actually the number of carbons in between. We don't count the bridge heads themselves, but just the number of carbons in between. And you put them in descending numerical order from highest to lowest. And so in this case, this is bicyclo three, two, one octane. That's how this works. Cool. So that's a simple bridge bicyclic, but what happens when you get substituents? So in this case, once again, we'll recognize those bridge heads. So, but we've got a substituent sitting out here and that's just simply a methyl group. And so substituents, you're going to name them the same way we did with regular alkanes. You're just going to put them at the beginning of the name before the parent, but you've got to give the appropriate chain locator, which means we have to learn how to number these as well. Well, the way this works, you're always going to give one of the bridge heads atom number one. That's the way it works. So let's just say I choose this one right here. He's number one. 
And then the way it works, because we name this from highest to lowest on those number of carbons in between the bridge heads, you number through the longest chain of carbons from bridgehead to bridgehead first. So here, that was this three pattern. So again, we had three over here, two over here, one up here. And so if I named him number one, then I'd want to go through here to two, to three, to four, and the other bridge head would be at five. And then you number through to the second longest ring, which is this one. So then six and seven, and then any other carbons to the third ring you need to give, that's gonna be eight. And now we've given all eight carbons in bicyclo 321 octane a number. And in this case, that methyl is attached to carbon number seven. Now, I just arbitrarily chose this bridge head to be number one. I could just as easily have chosen this one to be number one. And had I done that, then this would be one. And again, I would number through the longest chain first. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I see actually that gets me a better method. Just like we've done in the past, if I have a method of numbering, so there are two different equivalent methods of numbering, but one gets me the first substituent when I come across a lower number, that's a superior method. And so numbering this in red is actually the proper way where I get my methyl group located at position six rather than position seven. And so we'll get rid of these other numbers. And so when I chose this top carbon to be the, the number one at the beginning, I had a 50-50 guess, I guessed wrong. And so in this case, I should have chose the bottom carbon to be, the bottom bridgehead carbon to be number one, because I can get my first substituent, my only substituent, a lower number. And so in this case, this is now going to be six methyl, not seven methyl, and then bicyclo, three period two period one octane one big word no spaces in here or anything like that all right so that's a bridge bicyclic and we learned how to number it just in case you have a substituent and once again just a reminder many of you may not even name any bicyclic compounds so some professors and textbooks choose to leave these out but many of you are going to be on the hook for these so we're definitely covering them now moving on to fused bicyclics and your fused bicyclics you can find your bridgehead carbons yet again and what makes it a fused bicyclic is that your two bridgehead carbons are actually bonded together directly so in the, in the in the bridge bicyclic case they're always separated by at least one carbon or more no matter which path you take but in the fused bicyclic in one of the pathways, they're directly bonded to each other. All right, but it actually follows the same pattern. So in this case, the number of carbons as you go from bridgehead to bridgehead, if I take this pathway on the left, there's four carbons in between. If I take the pathway on the right, there's two carbons in between. And if I take the direct pathway, there's zero carbons in between them. And that actually gets included in the name here in this case. So with a fuse, your third number is always going to be a zero, and that's definitely got to be included in the name. And so in this case, we've got six, seven, eight total carbons again. So this is going to be some form of bicyclooctane yet again. And four, two, zero octane. So still numbering them in highest to lowest descending order. And in a fused bicyclic, that third number is always going to be a zero, but same set of rules. Now the Spiro bicyclics are going to be a little bit different. And your Spiro bicyclics typically have just two rings that share a single common carbon. And we call that the Spiro carbon. Now in numbering these and things of a sort, it works a little bit different. So we're going to have to use a slightly different set of rules. So first thing I want to do is identify that Spiro carbon. So I'll do that here in this case. So, and same kind of thing here. You want to count the number of carbons. In this case, instead of going from bridgehead to bridgehead, it's just taking each pathway to go from the spirocarbon back to the spirocarbon. How many carbons do you pass? So here, one, two, three, four. And here, one, two, three, four, five. And those are your numbers. But instead of going from highest to lowest, with a spiro compound, you're going to go from lowest to highest. And instead of starting the name off with bicyclo, the prefix for a spiro compound is just spiro. And so in this case, we're gonna call this Spiro. So, and then lower number first, higher number second. So Spiro 4.5. So, and then total number of carbons. And notice your total number of carbons is always gonna be your two numbers plus the Spiro. So a total of 10. So this is gonna be Spiro 4.5 decane. All right, so one last example. What do we do when we've got so a substituent, well, then you have to learn how to number these things as well. And that's unfortunate. So there's our 
Spiro carbon, and you don't make your Spiro carbon number one. That's tricky. So whereas back over here, we made one of the bridge head carbons number one. In this case, it's not going to be the Spiro carbon getting the designation number one. So again, we've got three, I'm sorry, four carbons in between uh, from Spiro to Spiro back to itself over here and five over here. And in this case, it's that methyl group. We need to know where he's located on that parent Spiro chain here in this case. Well, it turns out, first thing you wanna do is realize that we give the lower number before the higher number. And so you're always gonna number the lower chain before the higher in this case. Recall back with the bridge bicyclic and the fuse bicyclic, we always numbered through to the, and I should look at it back here. We numbered through the bigger one before we did the smaller one. So like here, we went through the, started with the bridge head at number one, and we numbered through the longest chain first. You number through the longest, then the second longest, and then the last is where you get the numbers. But with the Spiro, it's backwards. Since we number these backwards, you number through the smallest first. And the way it works is here's our smaller side, and one of the carbons next to the Spiro is number one, and choose one. So, so I'm going to make him number one. I could have made it either one in this case. And then you number through. Now, you could have made it either way. If one of the ways gives you a lower number for your substituent, then you should choose that way. Same kind of thing we got on before. So, but if I make him number one, he's two, he's three, he's four, and the Spiro is five. And then you go through numbering, go right through the Spiro and either go down to here or up to here and make one of these two numbers six, whichever one will get you your substituent lower number. Now notice whether I started with this guy's number one or this one down here is number one, it wouldn't have made a difference because my substituent's actually on the other ring. And so in this case though, the question is which one of these gets to be number six? Well, it's definitely gonna be this top one. That way I can get my methyl group located at position seven. Had we made this guy down here six, it would have been six, seven, eight, and it would have been nine methyl. Seven methyl is definitely superior. And now we found our way of naming this. So we'll start off with seven methyl. So, and then Spiro, four, five, decane. Cool, and that's all there is to naming bicyclic compounds. So, and again, not all students are gonna get this as part of their curriculum in undergraduate. It's just the way it works. So some books include it, some don't. Some professors include it, some don't. So, but a really good chunk do, and so it's definitely worth my time to go through. So, and even past that, a lot of students will get bridged and fused, and student, you know, a lot of professors just leave out the numbering system altogether and never ask a question involving one with substituents. That's possible too. And yet again, then a lot of professors will even just include the bridged and the fused, but leave out the Spiro. And if they do include Spiro, they're probably not going to include one with substituents or, you know, things of a sort. So this is of lesser importance than all the other nomenclature we've done. But again, for some of you students, you will need all of this. For others, who knows? So the rest of this chapter is going to be dealing with the conformations of alkanes. And before we move past nomenclature, because this is something we're going to keep revisiting over and over again throughout the course. But before we move past it for this chapter, I just want to address one thing you'll need for the future. It's not really too relevant now, but I did want to file it away in your study guide so you'd have a copy of it for reference later. So as we encounter different functional groups throughout organic chemistry throughout the entire year, we're going to learn a new uh, twist on nomenclature, something new we have to add for naming that functional group. And we'll find that for most most of those functional groups, they're going to have a different suffix at the end of the parent chain. So whereas others will be named as a substituent. And for some of them, you might have the option to name it as part of the parent chain or to name it as a substituent depending on its priority. So if you look at that list, you've got a whole host of priorities with carboxylic acid at the top and then acid and hydride and so on and so forth. And usually you're going to get one functional group with the highest priority that's going to be named as part of the parent chain. And then if you have any additional functional groups in your molecule past that one, then they're going to be named with a prefix instead. So as a substituent. And so you kind of got to know this general ranking. That way, you know, who, who's going to be named as a suffix on the parent chain versus who's going to be named as, as a substituent with a prefix instead. So that's kind of the idea behind that list. And like I said, we haven't learned how to name any of these functional groups yet. They're going to come, uh, you know, a couple here, a couple there throughout the rest of the year. Um, so, but I did want you to have this as a reference so that you know for the future. I will allude back to this time and time again throughout the course. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, please consider giving me a like and a share. Pretty much the best thing you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems or the study guides that go with this, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.